we're joined here this morning with Richard Taylor from Joyfly. Good morning. And Richard's going to discuss the the new concept of ADAS remote calibration and reprogramming of services components um, using multiple repairs and their uh, OE appliances. So Richard, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Not bad, thank you. Good. Would you like to run through your presentation, give us an oh. update as to what, what, what Joyfline is all about, the network, the advanced remote service, and how some of the repairers are able to capitalize on a new way of working? Yeah, I'll do that. Sorry, I thought we were going to have some, some kind of gen, general chit chat, so I'll jump straight into it. Uh, so morning, everybody. Thanks for dialing into the webinar. Um, I guess probably to start off with, probably Joyfline isn't really a recognised name, I don't think, within the industry. I think it's become more in, more recognised over probably the last six months, uh, certainly more so since I joined the, the business back in March. Um, but Joyfline is the kind of the main operator behind a number of the remote diagnostics services that are in the UK and across Europe. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the volume of, 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 of partners that we have, certainly within, within the European spectrum, but certainly in the UK. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's we effectively call it advanced remote diagnostics, advanced remote service. Uh, and this presentation will effectively show you why it's kind of the next step in terms of the remote world and, and how that works. First slide effectively is a an overview really of just Jifeline and who we are. So Jifeline was formed in 2012. Uh, it's effectively um, a remote solution that was born out of our key business, which is called Car Lock Systems. So the uh, owners of the business realized that if you're gonna code and program car keys using the OE tools, then effectively those tools can be used for other jobs. Certainly things like scanning, coding, programming and calibrations. That's effectively how Jifeline was formed. Uh, Jifeline launched itself effectively in Auto Mechanica in 2014. Um, started work with some local garages in and around the, the area within Holland where we're based. Uh, and in 2016, our first partner was launched and that partner's actually here in the UK. 2018 at Auto Mechanica, Jifeline won an innovation award. Um, and we've continued to progress in terms of the operation and the business since that day. Um, and it says that we've got around 100 partners across Europe. So that's 100 partners who effectively have taken our hardware and our software solution, rebranded it uh, into their own brand, uh, and then provide that solution to their own customer base. Um, I think it's key to mention that Jifeline in the UK does not have a technical team. Um, we have one in Holland, we don't have one in the UK, um, but our UK uh, sorry, our Dutch team effectively are there to support any of our existing partners as an outsourced service. We described it as an ecosystem. Um, so effectively, every time a new partner comes on board, we use their technicians or their technicians can be used within the system so that any other partner across the whole of Europe could effectively utilize any technician within our ecosystem. And there's about 250 plus technicians at the moment that are linked into that. Uh, to carry out any work that needs to be completed. So that might be specialist work for stuff like keys, tow bars, um, windscreens, et cetera, or it could just be general work for specific tools that the, the partner doesn't have and, and they require the OE tool to be used on those particular cars that are being worked on. Uh, we work across 20 different countries. Uh, that's actually growing now. I think we've, we launched a couple of new countries this year uh, that we hadn't been in so far. Uh, and there's around 13,000 customers that are currently utilizing the Jifeline solution, um, albeit under the partner's brand, not under the Jifeline brand. Um, we also have a, a, an automated function business, um, which effectively is uh, jobs that are being completed via algorithms and robots. Uh, and that's the, the standard, fairly basic jobs. Um, but that's something that we've launched um recently within the last probably six eight months uh, and it's something that's now starting to expand further uh, and as i've already mentioned we have our own in-house team um that effectively can support any of our partners that we may have to provide any work that is not completed by that partner or they require a technical expert to service that at work okay. so that's a bit of a business okay. overview yeah. bit of a business overview for jifeline uh, Okay, so um, as I've already mentioned, so we effectively provide the hardware and the software solutions, uh, and that's supporting anybody that wants to build their own their own diagnostics business. 
Uh, that's for anything that you would require to carry out on that work. So we don't just work across the collision industry, we work across the windscreen industry, we work across the service and maintenance industry, tow bar world, fleet world. Um, so anybody really that's effectively going to be managing a car that has a technical requirement on that vehicle to carry out some work, i.e. coding, programming, calibrations, and, and even scanning, deep dive analysis, that kind of stuff. We're the only organization at the moment that's providing the complete solution. And what do I mean by that? So effectively, this is about people being able to utilize their own technicians and their own tools and provide the service to either themselves in-house or provide the service to other partners or other customers as and when required. Um, so if you look at a lot of our partners here we have in the UK, they've effectively created a diagnostics business just utilizing our solutions that we have that we offer to those partnerships. I've already mentioned the ecosystem. So the ecosystem is quite unique. Um, and one of the reasons why the ecosystem is so valuable to the industry uh, and uh, the motor institute in, in, in its entirety, rather than just the collision industry, is that that contains, you know, all of the IMI, OEM trained specialist technicians uh, across the UK and across Europe. So what does that mean for our partners? It means that if a partner has a specific job that they don't have the knowledge, skills or experience to carry out or even the tools to carry out within the system, we're able to outsource that ticket to another partner who can effectively carry out that work on behalf of the original partner. So what it's effectively doing is utilising technicians across the whole of Europe. And any new partner that we bring on board, their technicians become part of that ecosystem. So not only is it a operation where they can provide the service to their own team in-house or to existing customers, but they also can then effectively pick up work from any other partner we have across the whole of Europe. So Richard, that, that implies that the technician that drops into with a ticket is, you know, capable, competent, and have the skills to be able to do what we in this country would expect to be done. Yeah, so any of our UK partners effectively are already working with body shops and there's a number of our UK partners um, that are doing that today and they're providing that service and we've got a number of partners here in the UK. Um, effectively, they are, um, some are OE trained technicians, so we have an OE partner uh, that has only OE trained technicians that are part of the service. Uh, we have IMI trained technicians within that system um, yeah. and effectively they would carry out the majority of work for their customer base. So they're only going to outsource where they either A, need to or B, don't have the required tool to be able to allow them to do that job. So what it means is effectively, we can always ensure there's an OE tool used on every single job, if that's the requirement of that particular vehicle. Yeah, but as the, the technician, who, how, how do you know what the technician capability is? So do, does the ticket come with some sort of certification to say that they're either IMI or OE trained? It doesn't state it within the system, but obviously each of the each of the partners themselves, they take responsibility for ensuring that their technicians are trained to the levels that we would expect them to be trained to. As I said, we, we just provide them with the hardware and the software solution for them to build their infrastructure around that. And it's then down to those partners to put in place the technicians that they need to service their customer base. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so effectively, there's there's three different ways uh, in which we can support our partners. And there's also a logical growth path that we have between the, the three different scenarios. And, I, and I'll take take you through the scenarios in a second. Uh, let me go on to the next slide. A little bit around the facts and figures. Um, so there's effectively 145,000 estimates were completed in November. That was courtesy of our lovely friend at Trend Tracker. This is not an exact science because it depends on the vehicles that go into body shops, clearly. Um, but on average, about 85% of those would be completed using the existing aftermarket tools. And that's going to get less as the technology within vehicles expands. So, you know, things like the secure gateways are making it much harder now to be able to read those vehicles unless you have the OE tool. Um, but if we assume that that's the, the, the average, therefore 15% of those are then going to require some additional work. And that could be remote services. It could be a dealer. Or it could be a specialist who turns up in a van at a body shop to carry out whatever work is, is required in that vehicle. So on average, there's at least two jobs, uh, two types of jobs that are completed on most cars that end up in a body shop. So that could be a scan and calibration or it could be a scan and coding and programming. There might actually even be three cases. There might be a, a post scan, depending on whether the company provides that as a single service, whether they add that into the service that they do, i.e. the calibration comes with a scan to ensure the calibration has been done correctly. Um, but effectively that equates to about just over 2000 jobs, which, you know, opportunities per, per day is about 20, 20 a day um, on a 20 day month. Um, 
So there's a good opportunity there for, for companies to get involved in doing the remote service or working with existing partners who do that for them. Yeah, or setting up a company yourself to be able to do this. So I'm... Exactly, exactly that, yeah. And, and that's effectively what most of our partners have done. They've realised that there is an opportunity here. And if you look at the opportunity, it is around the the dealer stroke specialist work that, that is required, yeah. And, and that's effectively where the aftermarket tool does not have that vehicle data within the system. So then the, the repairer has two choices. Um, in old world, in new world, they have the remote choice now, which allows them to connect to a remote technician using the OE tools to carry out whatever they need to do. So yeah, it's a, it's an opportunity there for people to look at that as a, as a business model. Uh, and another piece of information that came courtesy of Trend Tracker is around the additional cost. Um, so within the estimate cost, that's increased from an average of 118 uh, a year ago to now 218 average. Um, and that's where the diagnostics fees are added into the estimate process. So it just shows that there is now uh, additional value being added in as far as the estimate is concerned for the additional work that needs to be taking place around diagnostics, coding, programming and, and calibrations. So let's get into the options. Um, so we have three options in terms of the way the system works. So we have a service provider option and, and I'll show these in terms of slides as we go forward. Uh, that's effectively an external service provider that manages the front facing business, but the back office process is managed by a third party. So they effectively are selling the brand, selling the, the, the units, have the customer portal in their own brand, but working behind the scenes is an outsourced partner that manages all of that work on their behalf. That's option one. Option two is catalog partner. So what we have here is that they manage the entire process, including the back office process, which is the, the dashboard where the jobs are received, but they effectively outsource tickets to a chosen partner. And that chosen partner can be someone here in the UK, it could be someone in, in Europe, depending on what the needs of that vehicle are. So that gives them the flexibility now to deploy that work to the best place for that particular vehicle. And option three is a full partner. So that's effectively, they have all of the solutions that we have on offer. They sell the units, they put the OE tools in the background and they carry out whatever work they can carry out. There's kind of a 3.1, which is effectively if they can still outsource as part of that process. So even if they can't complete that work or don't have the tool, they can still outsource even if they are a full blown partner. Yeah. So that's the three options that we have. Um, so this effectively shows that in some detail. So as I've mentioned there, so the option one for partner um, is effectively that's where they just provide that VCI unit and they provide the customer portal that they log into to submit those jobs. That goes into our infrastructure, which is Amazon Web Services. That then sends that, that information, that job down the line to whichever service provider that partner has chosen. That partner is then carrying out that work with their operators and their diagnostics tools. And then you'll see on the far right hand side there, they can effectively then utilize the outsource function as and when they required to do that particular vehicle. So to summarize that, effectively the branding, the customer portal, the sales and marketing, the distribution is all done by the partner. Everything after that is carried out by the service provider. And then of course the original partner will then do the invoicing to the customer and the general support on that particular tool. So that's effectively how that works. The service provider gives you a dedicated service provider. He does the actual jobs using whatever tools are required for that particular vehicle. That's option one. Yeah. I mean, Chris has come up saying there's a big opportunity for individuals to use the tooling. Who would you say is your primary customer? Sounds like it's an agent or partner rather than a body shop. And that's the point you were trying to get across, wasn't it, Richard? Yeah, I think it, it, it. So I think if you look at how can a body shop get the value from this, right? So if you're a group and you have, you know, OE tools within your business, but you don't have them in every single site, you could effectively have a generic unit you plug into the car in that site that doesn't have it and then utilize your own tool behind the scenes. So that's effectively how it works as far as a body shop is concerned. Yeah. Um, you know, it's about utilizing the tools and the technicians you already have within your business and using them across your entire business. That's effectively how it would work as a body shop is concerned. So if ABC repairers have, say, 10 body shops and yeah. in every single 10 body shops, they've got a different manufacturers franchise, yep. whether it be Renault, VW, XXX, then body shop one that's Renault could service body shop 10 that has a Renault casual run needs a reprogramming. Uh, they could that absolutely, yeah, they could do that. Right. And then and, and outside of that network then, that 10 body shop ABC could say, right, actually I have these services available and 
XYZ body shops can say, well, actually, can you do this for me over here? And they could then sublet that service out to another third party. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Exactly. So all that third party would need is one of the, the partner VCIs that they just right. plug into that vehicle, submit that job. That job then goes into ABC body shop, who then carries out that work on behalf of the other body shop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the flexibility of the way the system works. Yeah. So there's effectively, they can either manage their own jobs in-house using their own tools they already have, or they could effectively yeah. provide those tools to other people to get value from as well. Good question. So effectively, if I now look at the option, second option, so the, the process is exactly the same. Yeah, effectively that works, but th this is slightly different because the partner has outsourced all their tickets, even though they've already they've got the catalog. So they effectively own the dashboard that receives the jobs. But what they do within the dashboard is then look at the outsource function to outsource those tickets to whoever is the best person to do that work. So as an example, ABC Body Shots might have a windscreen job that comes in, so he could outsource that job to the windscreen partner. He might have a tow bar job that comes in, so he might outsource that job to a tow bar partner. He's not physically carrying out any work, but he's effectively managing that work on behalf of his customers, utilizing the technicians within the ecosystem that allow him to do that process. So that's the difference, yeah. The partners are responsible for all of the process. All they're not responsible for is the technicians and the tools. So that just clearly outlines that. And then option three is effectively a full-blown partner. So this partner does everything, yeah. So the difference here is if I look at the process, in and around here, it's their own tools. It's their own technicians that carry out the work. So that's their business. Their business is a diagnostics business, and we have a lot of those in the UK. And effectively, anything they can't carry out is then carried out through the outsource function. But these guys will carry out probably a good 95% of the work that they're doing because they have the tools within their business to carry out that work. So they outsource very little as and when they require that outsource function to work. Yeah. So that's the three options. Um, and, and, and we have partners using all three. Yeah. So we have partners across the UK and across Europe that utilize all of those different options in terms of those, those selections that they maybe they may choose for their business. Yeah. This really is just summarizing it. So I'm not going to talk about this too much um, because effectively that's just summarizing the bullets that came up on the previous slides. So for the timescales, I'll move on from that. So where does the value lie? So it's a white labeled solution. Yeah. So effectively, the VCI, as you can see at the bottom, uh, the center one is the customer portal and the dashboard is in the right hand side. All of those are branded as partner branding. Um, and effectively, they will uh, provide those units to their customers under their own brand and provide that service. Um, the user portal, we have an API link so they can embed that information, that portal directly into their own systems, their own management systems, their own website if they needed to do that. So there's lots of ways we can do that in terms of embedding the information. We, we actually look after the branding, but we do have a requirement to have 50 units. The cost of branding is for 50 unit branding, um, but it, you know we can provide non-branded units. So they can be just plain, plain orange, black, gray, uh, and they can do the branding themselves. So it really does depend. The dashboard and the portal, they would be branded. That's online branding. So that's easy for us to do. It's just the JREX units, the physical VCI unit that we'd have to put branding on. There has to be a minimum order of 50 for those. We've talked about this. So there's a profit opportunity to selling this on um, to customers or others in the motor industry. You know, we've got we've got partners that work across multi parts of the motor industry. Um, yep. So they're not just body shop specialists. They've realised they can actually service windscreen companies. They could service SMR for coding and programming. Um, so there's a good opportunity for them to do that. Uh, customer proposition is clearly enhanced. As I said, we take care of the branding requirements, uh, and this puts full control into the hands of anybody that wants to utilize the solution. So they make the decisions based upon what's right for the customer, what's right for the vehicle, or what's right for the business. Yeah. So a little bit about existing partners. Uh, I won't go into detail on this, uh, but we've got uh, about 100 partners uh, that are utilizing our solution across you know, most of the main countries across Europe. Uh, that's expanding. All partners are linked into the ecosystems I've already mentioned, um, and they utilize that based upon their requirements. Across existing partners, we have specialists. So I think this is one of the key, the key messages is that there are generalist technicians within the system that carry out work across all vehicles. But we also have technicians that are specialists in certain fields. So that's windscreens, tow bars, key coding, you know, coding programming. There's a, a company that specializes in some of the deep dive stuff. There's crash data analysis partners in there. So there's, there's a fairly broad mix of partners that we have. Um, that cover most aspects of what the motor industry is looking for. Uh, and we're now working on 
for next year looking at new opportunities for other parts that we don't yet work with um, and how we can help support them and utilize the, the solution for them. Uh, any new partner that we have can obviously build their, their operation around the market needs, you know, using their own staff, their own tools, their own types of jobs they may want to do. Um, it's very rare for us to have specialists who just only provide that service. Um, most have realized that actually once you have access to the OE tools, you can carry out whatever work you need to carry out. Um, but most, you know, of those, of those partners, you know, do have the specialisms within their business anyway that they would they would they would promote as a, as a specialism. And all new partners become part of the ecosystem and can support any other partner that, that we have across Europe. And we've talked about that already, so I won't go on about that. Yeah. So the bigger that ecosystem goes, the bigger the proposition, the, yep. the better the solution, basically. Yeah, so every time there's a new partner comes on board, their technicians become part of the ecosystem. So that 250 grows to 260, to 270, to 280. But, you know, before you know it, you're at 300 technicians. Um, and we're looking at, you know, developing the, the dashboard to, to how do we utilize those technicians? How do we promote those technicians? How do we promote to our partners that there is a technician sitting in Germany that is a BMW expert? Yeah. yeah. We do that? yeah? So we're looking at a, a, a kind of, you know, how do we bring out the the benefits of the ecosystem? Because that's one of the key benefits of how this works is that, you, you know, you're never stuck for a, a tool or you're never stuck for a technician. It's just how do we make sure that people know who those technicians and those businesses are? Yeah. That's all development stuff that we're looking at. So this is really about, I've called it an advanced model. Um, you know, this is about standard versus advanced. So you know, plugging in a unit into a car and getting access to a technician, you know, there's a few people out there that do that now. For us, it's about the, the, the technician at the end of the line and, and what do you do next if that technician can't support that business, yeah? And there are vehicles that cannot be done remotely for numerous reasons. So we now have partners here in the UK that are mobile partners. So effectively, they are carrying out remote work. If that remote work cannot be completed for whatever reason, um, and it could be it requires a new sensor, it could be it requires wiring issues or whatever else there may be, then effectively that partner can then provide a mobile service to go out to that body shop, car side, and carry whatever work needs to be completed. So that's really supporting the whole key-to-key timescales as far as that repair is concerned. Yeah, couple of questions while you're there yeah so jay has come on saying asking do you need a stable broadband connection to be able to work on the vehicles i would suggest you do especially yeah. reprogram any of the components yeah um, we would always suggest just on that point we'd always suggest tom that they plug the ethernet cable into the unit into the wi-fi yeah. and then have that strong connection it works it is wi-fi based yeah but actually it's also got an ethernet connector we, we would always suggest when you're doing coding and programming Okay. And the other one is Dev's asking, what is the response time at the moment? So if you were to log a job, what sort of SLA are you looking at? Within a matter of minutes, mate. It, it, minutes is the worst, right? So we've got partners out there that as soon as the, it, it's automatic, right? So as soon as they send a job in by the customer portal, it pops up on the screen of the dashboard within yeah. our partner. And our partner then logs into that job, talk, okay. has a conversation with the technician, verifies what needs to be done and then they start the work on that vehicle and it's, so, it's live mate it's instant beep, beep. yeah so i mean i think you answered that just now but uh what happens if the tech dials in the vehicle and it's diagnosed that the vehicle then needs a new part it cannot be reprogrammed or calibrated then i assume you've got to swap the job yep. the so, part and then dial back in and yeah so job job becomes cancelled the remote job becomes cancelled, there's no charge. Yeah, so we don't charge for cancelled work. Um, that job would then be booked into a remote partner that effectively can provide that. So we have remote partners at the moment. They are a remote and mobile partner now. Um, so that mobile business would then be the one that gets deployed that work if they are used as the remote partner. Again, one of the development phases we're looking at for next year is how can our other partners utilise mobile operators to go out and carry that work to our site. Yeah. And that's something that we're looking at in terms of developing next year. We have them. We have mobile partners in the system, but that's only if they get notification with their own remote system. So just to clarify then, Richard, there's no yep. charge for the initial dial-in. Cancel so, tickets, no. No, okay. We don't We don't charge for cancel tickets. No, okay. The other one, I'm just trying to envisage in my head what it would look like once you place a job. Is it like something... You know, Uber Eats, something like that, where you, you you see the ticket, it's gone to the kitchen, it's made, driver picks it up, it's on its way. Is it that sort of countdown? 
Yeah, so uh, not not quite as extreme as that. So effectively, I'll talk you through the process. So the, once yeah. they've submitted the job on the customer portal, so the customer portal gives them, it, it does a VIN check, so it validates the VIN of the vehicle. Um, the, the customer car side will then choose the work they want to carry out on that car. So if they choose a calibration, they will choose the calibration uh, option within that dashboard, yeah, within that portal. That comes with a price, yeah. They will then submit that job to the technician. So that goes through the Amazon Web Services Cloud. That then appears on the dashboard of the technician remote side. So he sees every job that comes in, uh, pops up on his screen as an option. So he will then open that job and join it. So he's yep. effectively then in communication with the car side technician via a chat function. So if there's any information he needs further, he will ask. Um, but nine times out of 10, they will be completely clear what's been requested because that's come through as the ticket option. Once that job is then started, effectively that technician will just carry on chatting if they need to, to the technician, or they'll just notify the technician at the end of the process that job has been completed. Now that can take five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever the, the, the job requirement is. Um, we can also even blast the horn of the car to let them know that that job has been completed. So they haven't got to hang around by the car to wait for it to happen. They'll either get notified by a chat or we can like, notify them by a, a beep on the car horn. Um, so effectively, the, the they don't they're not really involved in that process once they've submitted the job yeah but that's consistent across all remote services once you've submitted yeah. the job you know the technician's involved in it if there's any more information required it happens via the chat function if there's no chat that needs to be taking place they'll just get notified the job's been completed so yeah, yeah. so that the, the back office dashboard is basically effectively lots of jobs appearing as they come in the technician simply just joins the job finds the relevant tool connects that tool to the car and then starts the process for whatever work is completed yeah, it'd be interesting to see, and I think Chris is alluding to this on the chat, that, you know, what's the what's the success rate of dialing in and completing the job as opposed to cancelling down the first ticket and then having to either go for mobile or re-go to the vehicle? Yeah, and that, I mean, that, that stuff we can share in terms of, yeah. I don't have that information. And the reason I have that information is because we provide the software and the hardware for them to do it. So I'd have to go to each of my partners and say, what's your success rate in terms of jobs that you receive versus jobs that are completed? Now, they'll all have different success rates, yeah? And yeah. that will be depending on the car, it will depend on the job, it will depend on the technician. So there's loads of things and reasons why that would be affected. Yeah. Um, the mobile bit is, is new. That's, that's very recent for us in terms of a recent partner that we've brought on board. Um, that provides that service so at the moment that's quite new for us so we don't know at the moment from their mi in terms of how how successful that has been um but we, we monitor it yeah we monitor all of our partners in the uk um to understand what they're doing their business model and how that works well if you could share it at a later date then it'd be something that we put on the website so everyone could see and we'd allude to that on you know uh, yeah def definitely definitely happy to, to share that you know obviously i'd have to do it anonymous because i don't want our partners to kind of you know oh, go right. out and broadcast it we can at least share it what to expect the other question i've got for you is the costing of this so yep. from a repairer's point of view if he's going to go to the trouble of doing this is there a cost he's going to bear and is there a cost out that he could invoice at? have you already established those costs or yeah, so anybody working with an existing partner today will know what their cost base is. Yeah, so they will know what they're going to get charged for a scan, calibration, coding and programming. So that's their cost, which effectively is them owning the tools, their technicians sitting there carrying out the work. So that's their cost base. Yeah, so they will charge that out to a, to a repairer to do that work. Anybody utilizing their own tools and their own technicians have already obviously covered that cost. So then it becomes a ticket fee. So we charge a small ticket fee for utilizing the solution. So that's the connection between the car and the dashboard behind the scenes, yeah? So once it gets into the dashboard, if that job is complete and successful, then we invoice that partner for that work, yeah? And that's a very small ticket fee. That depends on volume, right? So that's not a standard fee. If they do loads of jobs, it's less. If they do less jobs, obviously it's a little bit more. So that's how that works. And effectively, they would just buy the VCIs and they would have to buy what we call a starter pack. So the starter pack is effectively the dashboard that they log into to carry out the work. Uh, it gives them a local module that they plug the OE tools into um, and it, then they have to buy the VCIs to go with that, depending. And again, that depends on the volume. So anybody on this call that's interested in having a look at this, then obviously if they reach out to me, I can give them a full price list and that will highlight exactly what this would look like in terms of cost for units, for service, for the, the infrastructure. So just, just press that on that one a little bit more. So if a repairer says, right, I've got this job and I need it calibrated and it goes yep. up into the cloud, someone says, right, I'll have that ticket, I'll service that. 
could the cost change per partner the actually yes. grab the ticket? Yes. Do they then give the cost to the repairer? And yes. then the repairer has the choice to say, well, I'm not going to be paying that. 100%. So effectively, what, what happens, let, let's put that into a scenario, right? So you, you send a job to me and I'm, I'm the technician that's doing that, right? So you tell me you want to do a calibration. So I will tell you my calibration cost for that, that job is 150 quid, yeah? So you will look at that job and say, actually, that's fine because I'm going to build that out to 175 quid or whatever the numbers are. It doesn't really matter, right? So if you then want to outsource that ticket to a third party, you will see within the dashboard what that third party will charge you for that particular job, yeah? So you might be able to do it cheaper is what I'm trying to say, yeah? So you might be able to outsource that ticket to someone who's sitting in Germany or wherever who will carry that calibration for £125 and therefore that's a reduction in terms of what you're going to be paying out. So each of our partners has built their own pricing structure and their own pricing model based upon their business. Yeah, yeah. we don't we don't dictate as Jifeline what prices people choose to charge for these services. No. OK. Thank you. There's some more questions flying up. I don't know if we've answered all the questions, have we? Well, I, I, if you want to go through the present. I'll, I'll yeah the questions Fine. so I, I think i think probably cover that that slide off so effectively all that slide is saying is it doesn't just stop at the technician that's received the job yeah in our world it then goes into either an outsource technician if that job isn't done by the original technician or if that can't be completed then effectively there is a remote mobile partner that we could effectively utilize for that work that's all that's really just saying in terms of why it's kind of an advanced process cool. yeah just getting to the benefits um so I think we've talked about these really, if I'm honest, Tom. So I'll just flick through to make sure we yeah. we, we have picked them all off. But, you know, the, the key one is about using their own diagnostics tools and their own technicians and, and therefore only outsourcing the ones they can't do. Talked about the number of technicians in the business. Clearly, you can generate increased revenue um, and sweat your own assets that you have in your business. Or they can simply work with an existing partner who's already providing that service in the UK. And if anyone wants to know who they are, then if they just contact me directly, I can I can give them the names of our existing partners. Yep. Um and, and the rest I think we've probably discussed, mate, I think, in terms of that yeah. that slide there. Um financial model, and I see uh Dev's asked the question in terms of how much that is. So I'll go to Dev directly and give him the, the full price list. Um all they would have to do is purchase the starter pack, as I've already mentioned. As I mentioned, there's a small monthly user fee for utilizing the dashboard. Um, once a ticket is purchased, they simply just pay a small transaction fee um, for utilizing the hardware and the software solution. We mentioned outsource jobs. Effectively, they can sell their technicians time. Um, they can centralize their existing tools and there's no need to heavily invest in new kit because the VCI will work with any aftermarket kit. Um, so they haven't got to go change in aftermarket units to get access to a remote system. That remote system comes as a separate unit. Yeah. And Chris has also asked a question on, you know, why why drive fly? Why why not take the vehicle to the VM or why not use a competitor? hundred percent. They can do any of those. Yeah, but why? Yeah. So I think the why is that we've got access to 250 technicians that are IMI OE trained technicians. You know, if I look at others in this market, they don't have as many technicians, they don't have the ecosystem to allow access to those technicians. Uh, we have specialist technicians built into the system. So some that have come directly out of dealerships and trained by the dealers, windscreen guys do windscreen jobs all day long, uh, tow bar. So it, it's, that, it's that broadness and, and the flexibility of the number of technicians and those technician skills that allow more jobs to be completed remote. That's, that's one of the key benefits. The other benefit is that clearly from a remote perspective, if you can't carry out the job remotely, if you're in a body shop and you can't do it remotely what's your next step your next step is to either pick up the phone and call in someone to come and do it so how do you know that that person you're calling in has the right skills knowledge and, and kit to, to do that job or you go to a dealer and then if you go to a dealer you have the dealer delays that everyone talks about so is that something that repairers want to do now people will still do that that's fine that's that's their choice yeah people have their own business choices and their business models if for whatever reason they want to go to a dealer go to a dealer the dealer's going to use the oe tool so it's not like it's going to be a you know a problem for them to go to a dealership yeah so on on the costing then from um the perimeters well there are no perimeters really are there because the partner can charge whatever they want so yeah well, not not yes but but realistically they're not going to charge over the odds for something that they that others are in there doing for a a, a fee today are they people are going to you're right they could effectively build their own pricing model 
but they wouldn't they're not going to overcharge for this because if you're overcharging no one's going to use it no i'm thinking if they've got a four-week lead time i'm just taking the boundaries quite far now then they could cost that up have you spoken to any work providers insurance companies reference this solution and how's that sitting with them uh i've not spoken to insurance companies about this solution it's right. not for me to talk to insurance companies about the solution because it's my, my partners will be the ones that will work with insurance companies and some of our partners already do work with insurers um so it's not down to me really to kind of you know go to an insurance market and ask them to approve a a, a solution because right. effectively with the number of partners i have in the uk i'm asking them to approve not one not two but a few yeah so yeah. i think it's we don't want to get involved in kind of dictating who's being used for what service i think our partners you know, provide the service they're the ones that have to be trusted that the service is being provided correctly with the right tools and i think they're the ones that have to go to the insurance market and offer that up as an insurance solution good answer the other question the only answer mate the other question i've got is the iir which is um a couple of years old now yeah um, do you still see it fit for purpose or do you see that it's time for a review or um that's a loaded question isn't it because you know i'll have an answer do i think it's fit for purpose yes do i think it could be amended yes I think I think that there's technology advances in cars and it's going to get harder, right, for for this to be done. I think that there has to be an element of ensuring that that we as an industry understand where the shortcomings are in terms of the tools that we're using today. So, you know, I've I've had conversations with various body shops and, and owners of body shops about, you know, the tools that they use day in, day out. Uh, and one of the biggest problems that we have as an industry is that you know if you don't if you don't have data within a, within a tool to read the car it doesn't say i don't recognize the car it says i can't find any fault codes now is that confusing for people do they believe that car hasn't got any fault codes on that vehicle this is something i've been banging on about for probably a good two years that's a problem right because unless you unless you plug the oe tool into that car on every single scan how do you know correctly what fault codes are on that vehicle unless your tools are completely up to date now, you know, aftermarket tools, of course, they're great, but they are data driven. Yeah. So, you know, as long as that repair is keeping its tool up to date. So how do we ensure that those that have invested in tools ensure those tools are always up to date and fit for purpose in terms of the information? How do we therefore then encourage this industry to think about I should be finding some fault codes? So I've taken a bumper off. I've disconnected the tech. I'm going to plug it back in again, put a new bumper on. Now, how do I know that that hasn't got any fault codes? It should have fault codes, yeah, because it should now we need to recode or recalibrate. But if you're not finding fault codes, something in the back of their head should be saying, therefore, I think I need to plug something different into this car, yeah? So how do we? How does that become? How does that become the norm in this industry, Tom? How do we get people to think about, you know, am I certain that I've picked up all the right fault codes on this vehicle? You know, there's, there's if I go broader on this, you, you look at the, the windscreen world, yeah? You know, I've spoken to some independent windscreen guys who still genuinely believe they don't have to calibrate windscreen sensors and, and cameras because they've only taken the screen out and put it back in again. And that sensor, if it's a millimetre down or a millimetre up, is going to react massively differently to the way it was designed when it was built. Yeah. But what well, happens? What happens? Yards up the road. Of course, it, and then what happens next is, right, that car, and we all drive our cars knowing that that car's going to do A, B and C. But if that car doesn't do A, B and C because it's not recalibrated correctly, I'm now going to rear end somebody thinking that my car is going to carry on getting me out of trouble because people drive their cars, unfortunately, knowing that it's going to do something for them. But now it won't do something for them. So I think we just as an entire industry need to think about this isn't just a body shop. And I say this a lot. This isn't just a body shop issue. That's at the end of the line. There's many things that can happen on a car service, MOTs. You know, should we be pushing for MOTs to also include scams? To ensure that the tech in that car is correctly working there's lots of things that we should be doing as an industry to make sure that this isn't just about collision repair and how does it affect the collision repair industry so i think that sort of uncovers a a, a, a deeper sort of issue within adas and the industry so potentially what i'm thinking is from the MB, mbra point of view the iir definitely does need to be reviewed um, and we definitely do need to get experts around the table to start discussing it again to see what developments have been made, what opportunities there are for repairs to be able to 
you know work with vehicles a lot easier yeah and avoid some of the pitfalls that have been uncovered over the last two to four years so yeah, yeah I, I agree I agree and I think you know as I said it's not just this is not just a collision industry issue this is a you know you go and put four new tires on a car you really should re you know wheel align it and recalibrate it but people don't because well, it's my pocket that's paying for that job to be done and, and if I can get it done for a 400 pound cheaper because I'm not going to include those things I don't understand the industry I don't understand ADAS I'm going to do that because it's my pocket that's taken the hit so until every aspect of this industry the motor industry understands the need to do this kind of stuff unfortunately we're always going to be at the end of that line and, and it's always going to be the repairers that have to get the impact no i agree thank you for that richard that was my last slide mate other than my my obviously well, my email you. yeah well okay. uh, very informative it's, it's interesting to see what you're doing there richard um and giving you know the industry an opportunity to get involved in the adas boom and you know it's another another revenue stream that they could also get involved in um this is being recorded by the way everyone so it will be going up onto the mbra website um also the presentation is that going to be available as well richard yep yep it's available for anybody that wants it my email address is obviously on this last slide um if anybody's got any questions and, and are interested or want to understand who our existing partners are in the uk then just reach out to me and obviously i'll share that information with people directly um so open book me you know i'm always like that so uh, if people have any yeah. questions and just come to me yeah no good really appreciate you coming on today richard uh it's been a really good webinar and watch this thank you for time. i think there's more webinars to go on adas and i'd like to thank everyone for joining us on a monday morning and if we don't speak to you beforehand have a lovely christmas and see you all later thanks everyone take care bye, -bye. see you bye